So listen, uh, in the history of the 6-5, Daniel, you and I have, a, have had a very consistent conversation about, hey, things are going to get really interesting uh, when we see business value driven incrementally through quantum. Now, the reality is on any new type of technology, it has to go through a certain process, whether that's 5G that starts with research, whether that's generative AI that started with research three or four years ago, there was a seminal Google uh, white paper that came out. The same is true for quantum. So we're in this zone of trying to look at what the researchers and scientists are coming up with to give us a better view when there's going to be incremental commercial volume. And you're going to want to pay attention uh, uh, to this. Essentially, IBM and Berkeley came together, did some serious research, and essentially showed that you can show quantum value without getting to the point where, where you need perfect qubits, okay? Because the, the foregone conclusion and why people are like, oh, this is 10 years away, is that we need to get the qubits to perfection with fault tolerance. And what IBM and Berkeley showed is that uh, combining error mitigation with a hundred over a hundred qubit quantum computer, you can show value that cannot be done by today's supercomputer with a CPU and a GPU. Uh, I've, well, not me, uh, my quantum awesome analyst, Paul Smith Goodson, has published a Forbes article. Uh, I actually did an interview with the head of quantum at IBM, Dr. Jay Gambetta, when I was over in Paris. So I've been sitting on this uh, forever. It's pretty exciting. Uh, check it out. I think quantum is going to be here and adding commercial value before most anybody else thinks. And I think this is, uh, this is more evidence of that. So, you know, let me ask you, Pat, and, you know, normally I just come in and opine, but for a long time, you know, we kind of have had this thesis, right? It's that quantum is cool, but it's like for like 1% of 1% of 1% of the human population that are physicists or, you know, some type of, of uh, deep engineers that can understand just extraordinary technical prowess. And what's happened is, is quantum computing has kind of been lost. Remember Shamath Kalyapatiya? said it's uninvestable. Uninvestable, yes. And mostly because the word is utility. And I, and I, I saw Jay Gambetta quoted in um, the New York Times saying that that's what this moment is about. This moment is about finding utility. Do you, did you, is that what, is that kind of how you see it? It is. I mean, it solved a physics problem um, using noisy, noisy qubits that a supercomputer uh, can't. And it literally went head to head uh, uh, with it, right? You know, are, are we ready to, you know, parse this off and have Salesforce and Oracle Fusion use it uh, tomorrow? No, absolutely not. But what it did show is we didn't need to necessarily overcome having perfect qubits or what's referred to as um, uh, fault tolerance uh, out there. So to me, this is an in-between state that most people out there had not uh, considered. Because right now, people are lining up out there. They have either these perfect qubits, right? And, you know, like 12, <laughs> right? So it can't do much. And then you have these very imperfect qubits that are super, no super noisy, and you have thousands, tens of thousands. There was kind of nothing in between. And, and the approach that IBM had taken, which everybody was like, hey, Love what you're doing, IBM, but you're, the quality and the noisiness of what you have out there. And, and what IBM is doing is they are correcting those qubits farther uh, up uh, uh, up the path, which I think is something that uh, people hadn't thought of. And for a long time, by the way, you know, a lot of there was a lot of sort of criticism of superconducting. A lot of the ion trapping companies just said that they would never get the fault tolerance. That was, yeah. by the way, well, I, was, I had been somewhat convinced, but at the same time, betting against Google and betting against IBM from a bunch of smaller players, maybe there is a certain amount of experience that we have that would say that those aren't, aren't great bets. But remember, Pat, if we 
we say anything further far enough into the future, we can be right. You just got to keep exactly. pushing. Exactly. Just, just don't put a, just don't put a, or, and by the way, Daniel, when I was at AMD and NVIDIA was working with all of these researchers uh, on AI, it looked like a bunch of BS, okay? Where GPUs were were made to, to do compute. And when I was at AMD, we had ATI, we, we were working on it uh, as well. And it, it looked like the Kobayashi Maru. And, and then boom, University of Toronto uh, used NVIDIA GPUs to do image classification. Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it a human? And then it was, and then it was like, like people became believers. Uh, we are still waiting for that University of Toronto moment uh, for uh, quantum. But I, do th I don't think we're 10 years away. I, I just don't. Five yeah. years away feels uh, a lot more uh, comfortable uh, for me right now. There's something that maybe this generative AI boom can be attributed to in terms of making us smarter. And that's the law of diffusion of innovation is is being um, short is being uh, short circuited, meaning what used to take the diffusion of innovation used to take months to years, right? From the earliest adopters to laggards. And now what we're really seeing is like, would you say that someone that's just trying chat GPT for the first time today is probably a laggard at yeah, this point? Yeah. You're lagging. And what I mean is like, you know, it's just not true. Like, you know, when BlackBerry came into market, you know, there was like a few years by which BlackBerry users would have been considered kind of your early adopters, not like your leading edge, but just early adopters of smartphones. If you had an Apple iPhone in 07, 08, you were an early adopter of the iPhone. And all I'm saying is it took a few years. Pat, I mean, now we're seeing things down to months. Now, an enterprise technology like quantum is going to take longer, but don't bet on the, the long tail and some of the predictions that it's five and 10 years. These breakthroughs are coming faster and faster with less time in between. It's also another moment to just kind of, you know, I think the market grossly undervalues IBM's research. And I know that we've said this a lot, but, you know, like they don't value the quantum business at all when you look at the actual price of the stock. And I know that that's not our job, but I always look at that for ground truth. They don't value the research they do in semiconductors, whether it's around two nanometer or others. They just haven't found a way to value it. And so I'm hopeful under Arvind Krishna, and I'm hopeful that through whether it's licensing or through the products they're able to build and put into market here, that IBM begins to get credit for some of the really critical technology they've been able to roll into the market. IBM's doing some great stuff. Um, and the way that they're approaching uh, quantum is as if they've been through every major technology turn and they don't feel like they were getting credit uh, for credits due.